But Father, we truly do thank you tonight. We give you all honor and all glory. And Father God, right now, there are those that came out here tonight to sit in your presence and eat fresh manna from your table. They are not concerned about the things of this world. They are concerned about what's going on in the heavenly kingdom. And Father God, we know that you are alive and well, and we know that you listen to every word that we speak, good, bad, or indifferent. And we thank you, Father God, that you're loving, kind, generous, gracious Father who loves his children no matter where they're at or what they're doing. And Father, I thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. So therefore, if he's done all that to you, <clears throat> what I heard myself pray, then why don't we do that to each other? <laughs> Start forgiving and, and, you know, and not be loving and generous and kind. And it doesn't matter who it is. Um, just love. I was looking at the calendar last night and I said, well, God, April's about over. <clears throat> I hope that we've learned what love's all about because this is love month, right? But you know what? We're not going to stop when April ends, are we? No, we're going to keep right on loving. Well, so we're, you two are going on your journey again tonight, tomorrow, next year. When are you going? <laughs> tomorrow. Oh, you're not leaving until Tuesday. And how long are you going to stay this time? No, the answer is as long as it takes. Well, we will pray for you and we will miss you both. Did I speak for everybody or just myself? All right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God is good. God is really good. One of, our, one of ours are down. They're wounded. <clears throat> There's been a death in the family. And it's Sister Wanda. Please hold her up in prayer. Encourage her. Um, a whole lot going on in her life. And, and we just need, I, I promised her that I would tell you all. And we'd hold her up in prayer. All right? She needs our love and our prayers right now. You'll read about it in the paper. It was a shoot off up in Clayton. And uh, three people died. One was her ex-husband. So, and from what Nancy tells me, they have two boys, right? So anyhow, you know, you never know what life holds. One second you're laughing and praising God, and next second, you know, the devil's come in and he's wreaked all kind of havoc in your life. And that could happen to any of us in any given second of the day. So we aren't exempt from pain. So don't think we are. We are not exempt from pain. Well, I'm going to talk about healing tonight. I went back to my old notes, my old books that I was going to give away and said, no, I need to hang on to them. <laughs> so I brought all my newer books in here to put in the, in the bookstore to resell. I've never even touched them, so they're brand new. And I kept my old books. So let's go to Mark 16, 14. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as he sat at the table, and Jesus rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And Jesus said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. These signs will follow those who believe. These signs will follow those who believe. Not everybody can do this. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. This is a believer can do this a believer who is following God and anointed of God can do those things. So don't go around telling everybody, hey, you can do this. They have to go through the process you went through. They have to receive Christ and they have to allow God to peel them like an onion until everything that's not of God is out of them. And then he fills us with his glory and then we can do these things. Come on. All right, so 
when healing doesn't come, and listen to this, this is a lady, I have prayed and prayed, I have been in healing meetings all over the country, and have been prayed for many times, but still I'm not healed, can you help me? We have heard this cry over and over again, ministers pray for the sick, but usually they go away as they came, unhealed. We've witnessed that over and over and over again. Why? Because we do not have a complete understanding of what God's Word teaches on the subject. Too much emphasis has been placed on the practice of laying on of hands, anointing with oil, or praying for the sick. But there is more to healing than just anointing with oil, just as there is more to salvation than just a prayer. The anointing oil, the minister's prayer, the laying on of hands, these are just methods or points of contact. They will not heal you. These are just avenues through which we can release our faith in God's word. But if we do not know what God's word says, we cannot release our faith in God's word. A lot of emphasis is also placed on the gifts of healings, which are among the gifts of the Spirit, mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 11. And it tells us, therefore, to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to an to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one in the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So how are all these things done? Through the Holy Spirit. So if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, how can you possibly walk in the signs, wonders, and miracles? There will be manifestation of these supernatural gifts where people preach them and teach them, believe in them, and yield to the Spirit of God. But these gifts are not always in operation. That's why I can't see where prophet just prophet can just pop up and prophesy at any given time. That's the flesh doing that. And unless the spirit is moving, the spirit of prophecy is moving, you're going to give the wrong prophetic words to people. Okay? Kenneth Hagin Sr. said, I have found in my ministry of many years that usually these supernatural manifestations of healing are seen either among denominational people who have not heard divine healing taught or among, or among sinners. In other words, that's where the miracles can flow. I have seldom, if ever, seen them work for full gospel people. The believer should be healed by releasing his faith in the Word of God. Now, I, I'm st I stud started studying this because I'm asking God, okay, why am I not healed? Okay, that's why I'm studying this. And, and I'm going to get down to the bottom of this so that we all can get on the top of it. All right? Now... Gifts of healings and supernatural manifestation are given primarily to advertise the gospel and to gain the attention of, the out, of those outside the church. Gifts of healings and supernatural manifestations are given primarily to advertise the gospel and to gain the attention of those outside the church, not the inside. The signs are for the sinners, not for the saved. Now, Kenneth Hagin also said, in one of my meetings, I pointed to a fellow and said, Sir, you are unsaved. But the Spirit of God shows me that you have a double hernia. If you come here right this moment, I will lay hands on you, and it will disappear instantly. He did, and it did. At the altar call that night, he responded to the invitation and was saved. Two nights later, I laid hands on him, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, we need to distinguish the difference between healings obtained through supernatural gifts or manifestations and those obtained by exercising faith in God's Word alone. In other words, just because the Word says so, it'll happen. Now, we must also understand that the individual does not operate these supernatural gifts. They are manifested through him. And this what has bothered me ever since I've been a born-again Christian because preachers go out there and say, anybody can do this. No, they can't. 
and you see a whole lot of junk going on that's not godly, it's ungodly junk, and people are believing they're operating in the gifts and they're just operating in their flesh. You know, if you, I have seen this over and over and over again in the 35 or 40 years I've been ministering. And it has always bothered me. It will always bother me because you can do nothing outside of the Spirit of God doing it. All right? All right, let's just say, for instance, whenever I was first born again, um, I was a deacon in a church. And y'all know I killed my dog, hit him on the head with a broom by mistake. And my grandson said to me, you better bring him back to life or I'm going to tell the people on you. <laughs> so I'm down there on the floor and you're praying life back into this dog, praying as hard as I can possibly pray. And he said, I'm going to go tell the pastor you killed my dog. So I kept praying harder and harder and harder. And I'm going to tell you what happened. The hard, longer I prayed and the harder I prayed, I felt it start moving down deep down inside of my belly. And that thing just kept coming up, coming up till that dog came to life. See, my fear of being exposed for hitting a dog in the head <laughs> caused my faith to work overtime, and God healed, and God brought the dog back to life. But he wouldn't have come back to life if my grandson wouldn't have kept saying, you better do it, pray harder, pray harder, until finally the dog came back to life. But it was my faith, well, it was my fear <laughs> causing my faith to work that did it. And one other time, um, my grand, my uh, my daughter's daughter was in a real bad automobile accident, and she couldn't. She went, drove underneath a Miss Debbie's truck close to where you live, and um, it all ended up. She was she couldn't walk right, and she couldn't talk. And I knew that if I brought her here, and she said in the church services, she would be healed. And so at the end of one of the church services, I was, she was on the floor and I was praying over her. Um, now, that, now this was a dumb thing to do, so don't you do what I did. And I felt, the, I felt the Spirit of God really getting deeper and stronger. And I kept praying and I, I just, I knew she was ready to be delivered from that spirit that was holding her in that condition. And then I started listening to the voices around me. And they were all laughing and carrying on. And I said, and this is dumb, I said, well, if they don't care, why should I? And I got up. The girl was still in the same condition as she was 20-some years ago. My fault. And I keep, you know, I've asked God to forgive me for that. Why was I concerned about what, was, what the other people were doing? Why was I concerned that they weren't putting their faith to work with my faith? I had enough faith to deliver that girl from that spirit. And she was being delivered until I got up and quit. You have, if you're going to believe that you can heal, you know, that God can heal somebody through your delivering them from some sort of spirit that's binding them up, then you, when you start putting your faith to work, keep it working until it happens. All right? Keep it working until it happens. I was in a church one time when I was very first born again and this lady she came in and her head was sideways she always looked that way and God told me he said that's a spirit binding her neck um, well the, I found out the pastor didn't like, like her and I was praying for her one night and I prayed as hard as I could pray and I was believing as hard as I could believe and I was binding that spirit and I felt her neck start moving and the pastor come by and he tapped me on the shoulder and said get up let her alone. And I said, but it's, it, the spirit's leaving. Get up, leave her alone. I stood up and her neck went back, her head went back to where it was and she never was delivered from that spirit. Now see, if he wouldn't, you know, and I had to obey him because he kept saying, get up. Now if I would have kept it up, that woman's, that spirit would have left her neck and she would have been healed. I'm telling you guys, you're going to have to understand that God is real that healing is real. And when God told me that's a spirit binding her neck up like that, you pray and, you, and I'll set her free. I'm so sorry that man had to interfere and the woman died in the same bondage. 
if you're going to, you know, I should have went ahead and did what you He kicked me out of the church. That's fine. I should have kept on praying until she was totally set free. And I didn't. If you're going to start, finish. If you're not going to finish, don't start, is what I'm saying here. So I said, we must all also understand that the individual does not operate these supernatural gifts. They are manifest, manifested through God. See, God said, she has a demon. If you pray, I'll set her free. It wasn't me just going up there and saying, well, I don't know what's wrong with this lady, but I'm going to pray and try to get her neck straight. That isn't the way it worked. We, we cannot make them work any time we want the gifts. We cannot make them work any time we want. We can say something, but it won't work. Our job is to stay open for the manifestation of the Spirit as the Spirit wills. I don't know about you, but every service I come in here, my, I'm open for God to do whatever he wants to do through me to set the people free or just to do whatever he wants to do just because, not even use me. Are you understanding this? And see, if we would all come into this sanctuary saying, God, let this be the day that you, you will to let your spirit move in this congregation and heal all who are sick or deliver all who are bound. If we really did that, I, I'm not going to call you and say, all right, we're all going to believe for this today. No, it's something you're going to have to desire from the very depth of your heart. And then when we come in here together, the, the anointing will be so strong that God can do whatever he wants to do. All right. All right, let's go to Mark 6, 4, and 6. Jesus told them, a prophet has little honor in his hometown among his relatives on the streets he played in as a child. Jesus wasn't able to do much of anything there, you in his own hometown. He laid hands on a few sick people and he healed them, and that's all. He couldn't get over their stubbornness. He left and made a circuit of the other villages, teaching and teaching. Notice that Mark didn't say that he wouldn't do any mighty works there. He said, Jesus couldn't because they did not believe in him. And so Jesus could not do any mighty works. It could be somebody might come in here and they might single one of you out that you know, you've, been, you've been going around healing people and they're just going to come in here and just see what you can do. God doesn't move usually in those circumstances. God doesn't have to do that. So they really don't want to be here. We've had people come in here and they've said to me, I just came to see what you could do. I can't do nothing. It says Jesus wills that things happen. Are you listening here? If you're going to go, if you're going to go and be part of a revival, then you're going to have to understand that all you are is the vessel. That's all you are. You're the one that walks in and keeps the doors open, and you, and you're, you, know, you don't even have to be here. You're just the vessel that God uses to open up the doors, and God can do whatever he wants to do with or without you being there. We've heard many times when, when revivals were breaking out, and we had revivals all the time. The pastor wasn't even to church the day that the glory fell on the church, but he was the vessel that God used to have the church doors open. And it was because he did was did what God told him to do that God was able to work in those in those churches. All right. The Amplified New Testament says Jesus laid his hands on a few sickly people. In other words, they were just sickly, nothing like blindness or deafness, no crippled or palsied. In Matthew thirteen fifty eight. It says, and Jesus did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Their unbelief hindered Jesus. Now, I'm going to tell you, I have prayed for people. You know, God said to me, tell them this or tell them that or do this or do that. And they were healed and they were full of unbelief. But God wanted to show them how powerful he was. God was trying to get them delivered from their sinful ways. And, you know, God just did it whether they believed or not. And this is what's going to happen when we start bringing the lost into the house of God. They're not going to believe. They're going to come in here laughing and ridiculing, and God's going to show up and show off and show them who he really is. All right? But we're going to have to have the mindset that God is going to do that. 
And we're going to have to have the mindset, it's not us that's doing it, but it's God. All right, in Luke 4, 26, Jesus said that when there was a great famine through the land during Elijah's time, there were many widows in Israel. And verse 26 tells us, but unto none of them was Elijah sent, save unto Serapin, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. There was a lot of widows in this town, but the only widow that Elijah was sent to was this one particular widow. Even though Elijah had God's power in his life, he could not make it work for everybody. But because he was sent to this particular widow's house, there was a continuous miracle. The mill barrel never became empty. They just kept dipping mill out of it, and the cruise of oil never ceased to flow. And Jesus went on to say in verse 27, And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elijah, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. See this? Naaman traveled many miles to reach Samaria, where he had heard a prophet could rid him of his leprosy. Yet there were many lepers in Israel at this time, and Elijah didn't cure any of them. It took, it took God's anointing to do the miracle. And God can use his miracle working power on whomsoever he wills. Elijah had a double portion of the anointing of the Spirit of God upon him to minister. And the Bible records that he did twice as many miracles as Elijah, his predecessor. There were lepers in Israel, but not one of them was healed. Yet to Naaman, a Syrian, he said in 2 Kings 5.10, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Now, he just spoke to that one, right? So why didn't the lepers in Israel go to Elijah and get healed too? The answer lies in the Israelites' covenant of healing with God. In that covenant, the Lord said, I am the Lord that healeth thee. In Exodus 23, 25, and 26, he said, I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. The number of thy days I will fulfill. Then again in Deuteronomy 7, 15, and the Lord will take away from thee all sickness. You see, they didn't really need any prophet to heal them. They needed to believe the covenant that God had established with them. Naaman, who wasn't even under that covenant, believed and was cleansed. See, he wasn't under that covenant. Nobody else had to call anybody else to him. God said, I am the God that healeth thee. And God wanted to heal everybody in that place. Just because he's God and just because he made a covenant. Some people think that if someone is a prophet, he is a seer and knows everything all the time. However, the gifts of the Spirit are not in operation all the time, but only as the Spirit wills. Um, one time, uh, there was a young lady who had a really bad car accident, and, and she her legs were all twisted, and, and she walked, you know, with twisted legs, and and, got, and the doctor told her, you, you'll always walk that way. And she came into my house one day and was walking down the hallway, and I walked out of my bedroom and went by her, and the Spirit of God said, go back. So I went back, and he didn't say nothing. I just, he just made me bow down and pray for her legs. And I just ran my hands down her legs and prayed for her legs. And she said, well, thank you, Mama. And she went on. By the time she reached the door, she was going through. Her legs were totally straight. Now, see, I didn't know that she was coming to my house. I really didn't even know she had that accident until that day. But God wanted to heal her. He wanted to show her his mercy and his grace. She's walking perfect to this day. It wasn't me that did it. But I was a vessel God wanted to use to do it through. It was God who straightened out her legs. Are you understanding this? See, if you walk in the Spirit, live in the Spirit, and, and follow the commandments of God and are walking a pure and holy life, God said be instant in season, out of season. And that means he can use you anytime he wants to, to do anything through you that he wants to do. 
See, we don't quite understand the scripture properly, and therefore we're just going we're just flip flopping around like fish in, out of water. And if we really knew what the word really said, then we would understand that we live the life that God wants us to live, and then He can use us any time He wants to use us. Remember that time I told you about Brother Larry when he first started coming to church here and he came up for prayer about something and he walked away. And God just said to me, oh, by the way, your back's healed. There was other people in the church that had bad backs that night, but he's the one that got healed that night. He didn't heal anybody else but him. You see, God can do whatever he wants to do because he's all sovereign. And so people say, well, okay, why, why didn't you come and pray for me like God healed me? Because God didn't send me to you. In fact, he didn't send me to him either. I was standing right there, and he was right where Barbara's at when I told him. And he went on thinking. He said he was like, yeah, uh-huh, because he really couldn't sleep or nothing, but the next morning he was totally healed. God is gone. All right, we should stay open for manifestation of the Spirit of God, but we do not have to wait on a supernatural manifestation to be delivered from anything that is wrong with us. We should be open for God to heal us at any given time. And we don't have to start waiting for a you know, supernatural manifestation to happen for the healing to take place. One time whenever we was having all these revivals, there were some always new people. And this family of five came in and sat back there in the corner. Never been in our type of service. And, and I was up here doing something and God said, tell them to come up here. So I said, hey, all you, you five in the back row, come up here. And God said, line them up over here. We line them up right here. And God says, tell them to put their hands up near. So I said, put your hands up near. And by the time I said that, they were all on the floor. They stayed there the rest of the service. When they get up, they said, we'll never come back here again. <laughs> Scared them to death. We've never witnessed this, and we don't want to witness this ever again. But see, God knew. God knew they didn't know all that. And God was, I think God was showing, I'm here, and he was showing off. He would show off his power and his authority to any. And they didn't believe when they came in. They came in and just wait to see what was going to happen. Well, God showed them. <laughs> and I don't know where they're at, but I never saw them again. So. Okay. The gifts of healings have been manifest in, in my ministry many times, but that does not mean I can make it work for everybody. Any more than Elijah could make it work for everybody. Now, you know, everybody knew that I was raising the dead. So we had a couple people come in here and, okay, you've raised the dead. I'm dying. Raise me up. They didn't get raised up. It was not my fault because I'm not the one that raised them up. That God did. And God even told us what was wrong with them and why he couldn't raise them up. And they would not believe us. And they died. It was not our fault. If they would have done what God told them to do, like he told the leper to go dip in the water, then they would have been raised up. And, they, and then afterwards, one of the wives said, we knew you didn't have any power. Yeah, I do, but it's not me doing the healing. See, it's God doing the healing. So don't let that hinder you if people say that about you. You're not doing the work. All right, so I can't push some button or pull some lever and it will start working. It operates as the Spirit wills, for He is doing it and not me. There's somebody sick in my home right now, and they keep telling me I don't know what's wrong with me, and I keep listening, and God isn't telling me anything, not even to pray for them. And I said, well, I just hope you feel, as I went out the door tonight, I said, I hope you feel better before the evening is over. See, I can't even pray for somebody unless God tells me to. That's the way I operate, because I'm just wasting my breath and your time. All right, And I'm not going to pour a bottle of oil over your head and say, be healed or do this, that, and the other in the name of Jesus, because it doesn't work. I've just got you good and oiled. We wasted a whole lot of time. All right, this is a story. A Pentecostal lady brought her little girl for prayer to, to Kenneth Hagen Sr.'s meeting. This child, who was between eight and nine years old, had also been stricken with polio. Her left, see, he had just healed a little boy of polio a couple nights before in this tent meeting he was holding. Her left leg dangled from the hip. A brace was on her foot. But when her mother took the brace off, the child couldn't walk. The limb was wasted away. 
All right, so I wrote that down, but I want to tell you that she brought her daughter to put Kenneth Hagin in his tent meeting so he could pray for her, believing that she was going to be healed because two nights before, a little boy was healed, all right? So... A brace was on her foot, but when her mother took the brace off, the child couldn't walk. The limb was wasted away. This time I felt no supernatural manifestation, Kenneth Hagin saying this. There was a matter that I had, this was a matter that I had preached God's word to her, and she believed. You know, she preached on healing, and she believed the healing would happen. I laid hands on the child, prayed, and there was no manifestation. She took the child home apparently in the same condition as she brought it. At home that night, the mother took the child's braces off to give her a bath before putting her to bed. The foot still turned. The leg still hung out from the hip. She put her in the tub, then got on her knees and started to bathe her. The mother began to cry and say, Lord, I am sorry. I wanted my baby to be healed. The mother said, then I remembered what Brother Hagen had said, and my faith quickened. See that? I believe the word of God, the mother speaking. I believe that, that, that healing virtue flowed into her then when Kenneth Hagen prayed for her. It was just a matter of believing God's word. Suddenly, I heard something like dry sticks popping. I looked down, and that leg straightened down right in front of my eyes. Both legs became the same size, and she could walk normally. So this miracle came as a result of preaching and teaching the Word of God and of a faithful mother's believing and acting upon God's Word. See that? It didn't happen when, 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 the, preaching, when the laying on the hands was but it happened later on that night. We believe in super, you know, this church, I'm, I'm, I think I'm preaching, for, speaking for all of you, we believe in supernatural manifestations and we should expect them. We believe in it and we should expect them. But in the meantime, we must preach God's word and believers should continue to feed on God's word concerning divine healing to keep their faith strong. Healing belongs to all of us in here because of the cross. In Mark 16, 19, So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and set down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. So after Jesus died, the disciples went out and preached the word, and then the signs, wonders, and miracles came along with the preaching, the word. Now, God says, healing in my wings. I am bringing healing into this place this night, and I want to heal all your infirmities, not just one or two. I want to set you on the highest pinnacle of the mountain, and there you will minister out of the heavenly realm instead of the earthly realm. Too many sick in my houses, and what kind of testimony is that? It is time to step over into the healing waters of Bethesda and be healed from every infirmity. What God is saying there is that we need to be an example for the world to see. They need to see us healed, walking in complete health, and then they're going to believe in the healing power of our God. If they see us sickly, they're not going to believe but, you know, then I always think about Francis Hunter, who they had a big healing ministry, did all kind of miracles. And she had that sore in her leg, and she just knew God was going to heal her while, you know, while she was doing his work. But the leg got worse and worse to the doctor, said, if you don't get it, let us do something with it. It's going to come off. We're going to take it off. So she went into the hospital. They did what they had to do. She went through the healing process of not being able to walk on her leg until it was healed. But she still, she had her leg. She doesn't understand why God didn't heal her. I don't understand why God didn't heal her. And she doesn't understand why she had to go to a doctor, and I don't either. Now, in my case, I want to go back to the doctor, but God says no. So, and then he tells me, you are healed, and I'm waiting for you. <laughs> So this is why I'm going back and reading this, these books on healing. I am missing in an ingredient somewhere 
in getting my healed. God said, you're healed in the heavenly, now bring it down to the natural. And I don't know what I'm missing, but I'm going to find out. And each one, I don't know if any of you in here have a sickness in your body, but God, once you're already healed because of Jesus and the cross, we're missing an ingredient. And we need to find out what that missing ingredient is so that we can be made whole from the crown of our head to the soles of our feet. Now, God just said, healing in my wings, I am bringing healing into this, this place this night, and I want to heal all your infirmities, not just one or two. I want to set you on the highest pinnacle of the mountain, and there you will minister out of the heavenly realm instead of the earthly realm. Too many sick in my houses, and that is true. So this, God wants to bring healing into your body tonight. Do you have faith to believe that if you come up to this altar, that when you leave this altar, you will be totally and completely healed from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet? If you do, you can come up to the altar.